It's a pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sonia, Sonia Angel, who presently is in CDC as Senior Advisor for Non-Community Diseases Center for Global Health in CDC Atlanta. Uh, Dr. Angel uh, did her undergraduate work at Indiana University, where she majored in uh, political science and journalism, which actually is relevant to what she did later. Uh, received her MD from UCSF, became a resident at Brigham and Women in the primary care program. She also obtained a degree from London School of Tropical Medicine uh, while a resident uh, in, in Boston, and then later on an MPH from University of Michigan. She uh, then did a fellowship as RWJ, a clinical scholar at University of Michigan. Following that, was recruited immediately in 2004 to New York City, uh, the center of activities for public health in the service of the people of New York, led, as you know, by uh, the mayor of New York City and Dr. Tom Frieden, who was the head of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in New York City. She was director of cardiovascular disease prevention and control program for seven years, and during that time, she accomplished several areas which made the news, are still in the news. Uh, for example, the area of trans fat in New York restaurants, National Soil Reduction Initiative, uh, establishing nutritional standards for food procured by New York City government agencies, and Clinical Quality Improvement Initiative for blood pressure and cholesterol control. Many of these, obviously, are still in the public domain because there is still controversy if you read last night, New England Journal of Medicine, there are two perspectives on the front page of New, New England Journal of Medicine regarding the latest attempt of controlling the amount of sugary drinks in New York. And so she was in, really in the midst of all of these changes occurring in the area of public health in New York City. She then moved on uh, to Atlanta to become senior advisor for non communicable diseases in Center for Global Health, where she oversees all the activities in this area for CDC. Uh, she is, uh, represents CDC in WHO, uh, in store medicine uh, uh, in, in this area, and really is working in the area that's becoming increasingly important in the poor region of the world. She has seen multiple awards, including AOA as a medical student, Partners Award for Excellence when a resident at Brigham, Distinguished Service Award, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Interestingly, she continues to write about her experiences in multiple journals, including Annals of Central Medicine, uh, Science, and Editorial uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, journals of epidemiology and public health. So it's really a pleasure to have you at Yale. I'd like to welcome you to the podium. Thank you. It is, um, it is such a pleasure to be here. I, I spend a lot of time on the road in other countries, as is the job in global health. So when I have the opportunity to, to stay home in the United States and talk to colleagues here and learn a little bit about what you're doing and share what we're doing, it's a, it's a, it's a great treat. And I think it's increasingly important as we struggle in this changing climate, this economic and uh, health environment, to try and figure out how to work appropriately in the United States to address some of our greatest challenges, many of the opportunities for learning exists not only here, but abroad as well. And so to the extent that we continue this really important interchange, I think we're all the better off for it. So I'm going to talk to you today about decreasing global non-communicable diseases by reducing risky behavior. And I like that term, risky behavior. We'll go through and sort of tear it apart and build it up again. But I think it's something that we, um, we associate with our individual actions. And I think by the end of this presentation, you'll understand a little bit more about how we think of it from a public health perspective and what our responsibilities are to help support changes in individuals and make things easier for us. So my financial disclosures, I have no relevant financial relationships to this presentation. And so briefly as an outline over the next 45 minutes or so, 50 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you first about the context for global non-communicable diseases, talk about the 
environment in which we exist, the global community, talk about a little bit of the epi epidemiology related to non-communicable diseases, and the way in which we're facilitating these so-called risky behaviors. And then go through a discussion about how to modify risk by giving examples related to two of the greatest and most important risk factors related to non-communicable diseases, hypertension and tobacco use. We'll talk about the community and the clinical context, the, the latter being perhaps more relevant to what you do every day. Um, for your work, but all of us uh, exist in the community and are influenced by it. And then ultimately talk about some lessons learned and then bring us to uh, some conclusion about how we can really move forward and make a difference together. So our world is large and it's diverse, and yet it's becoming increasingly familiar and similar. For the first time in human history, more humans live in urban areas than in rural areas. And so we're increasingly sharing the risks associated and the opportunities associated with those physical environments. Our environments, in terms of retail, shopping, uh, the economy, are also increasingly familiar. This is an interesting list that I pulled that looks at the um, top 10 retailers in 2011. And on the left-hand side is the list of those in North America. On the right, it's worldwide. And what you'll see immediately is in the top 10 list, Walmart and Kroger, both um, feature in worldwide in the top 10 list. And if you go out to the top 24 list, eight of those top 10 companies that you see there in North America feature globally in the top 24 retail uh, stores, which means that these are places where not only we are shopping, but other consumers and our, and our um, colleagues around the world are shopping and being exposed to. Similarly, when we look at the top 10 food and beverage companies, so the foods that we eat every day, you also see this globalization that's occurring. Again, in North America compared with worldwide, you look at Nestle, Kraft, PepsiCo. These are all uh, featuring globally. And other uh, products that we buy every day from Unilever, et cetera, may, while they may not have been on this top 10 list in North America, they certainly continue to feature globally. So again, not only our urban physical environments are becoming familiar, but the products that we're exposed to as well are much more simil similar. As are the risk factors for death when we look at low, middle, and income, uh, high income countries. So this is an interesting slide that ranks deaths attributable to leading risk factors by country income level uh, in 2004. High income is, uh, is indicated by the dark blue, middle by the light blue, and low income by the yellow. And two things I want to point out. First of all, is that high blood pressure and tobacco use is the leading cause, leading attributable risk factor to death, not only in high income countries, but in middle and low income countries around the world. And also would like to, to point out how, how much, how important they are uh, relative to other risk factors. Not to suggest that all of these risk factors aren't important, but also just to point out that there are some commonalities that we have, that if we think about them constructively together and think about solutions together, some of the solutions as well as some of the problems may be quite similar. This slide looks at the increasing burden of chronic non-communicable diseases comparing 2008 to, to what's projected in 2030. Again, this looks at this um, epidemiologic transition that's occurring in our world. And it illustrates that why, while in high income countries, we, we may have already reached the point of change, and there will perhaps not be much more, uh, more of a change in terms of the proportion of contribution of non-communicable diseases, low and middle income countries first will be achieving those changes by 2030. And the second thing I want to point out, so if you look at the top sort of row of pie charts, on the far right is low-income countries in 20, uh, 2008, and then what's projected in 2030, you see this remarkable increase in the contribution of non-communicable diseases. Albeit now, it's still a very large contributor, but will increase dramatically. And I think this points out a couple of opportunities. One is that much of the transition that we've gone through, we've already reached and overcome some of the challenges, and some we have not. And there's a lot of learning that can occur, not only in thinking in low and middle income countries about what they could do to be successful, but also what they could avoid. What is the trajectory that we took, that if they took very conscious and made very uh, uh, intentional decisions, may they not end up in the same place that we've ended up at? Or could they get to our level of health or a higher level of health much more rapidly? So the burden of global non-communicable diseases is daunting. This looks at... Uh, total uh, global uh, deaths from non-communicable diseases. Um, and I, what I want to point out, first of all, is uh, that 60, approximately 60% of all deaths globally are due to non-communicable diseases. About 80% of those deaths occur in low and middle income countries. And second, I'd like to point out that cardiovascular disease 
and cancer make up a very large proportion, followed by respiratory diseases and diabetes. And as a result, those four major diseases, including because their risk factors are shared, have become the focus and topic of a lot of energy and uh, innovation and implementation of programming and, uh, efforts globally to address noncommunicable diseases. To do nothing is not an option. The economic impact of non-action around non-communicable diseases is huge. Um, the Harvard School of Public Health, working with the World Economic Forum, developed these uh, estimates in 2011 to look at the impact of non-action. They looked at first the cumulative output, lo output losses from non-action in 20 years by the year 2030. And the estimated loss was $47 trillion. Now, that's a huge amount of money. And it, quite frankly, when we get into these trillions of dollars, it means absolutely nothing to me anymore. It's just huge. Just huge. That's all it is. So I think the second bullet is very helpful in that it sort of puts it in perspective. And $47 trillion represents 75% of the global GDP in 2010. So that helps you kind of get your head around about how, how important non-communicable diseases can and will be if we aren't effective in taking action globally. The cost of illness CVD model estimates an increase of about 22% by 2030. This threatens country level and global development agendas. So it becomes even more relevant as we talk about the global uh, millenni millennium development goals, et cetera. That this is, again, something that we can't overlook, that we need to incorporate it. Even though in low income countries it may not be the predominant concern, it will be, and it will undermine many of our achievements if we're not careful. So this is the way the global community has organized its response. Again, it's really focusing on the common risk factors, looking at the major causes of death with the intermediary of uh, metabolic risk factors of concern. So the areas that have been most focused on in terms of sharing information, sharing uh, interventions include tobacco, the focus on poor diet, harmful use of alcohol, and physical inactivity. So now let's get to risky behavior. Because again, when we're talking about these um, these diseases of non-communicable diseases, they, we talk about them as lifestyle diseases. We talk about them as if they're on, under the control of the individual. This slide, and you can repeat the slide in the United States or any other country of choice, is looking at prevalence of obesity between 1980 and 2008 by gender. Uh, women are on the right and men are on the left. The red lines indicate um, the prevalence in 2008 versus the blue lines, which is the prevalence in 1980. And this is just a sampling of countries. Um, and, and what I think I'd like to point out on this slide is that, first of all, in both genders, obesity is increasing, albeit somewhat in some countries a little, uh, uh, a little different, but not radically different. Second, it's increasing everywhere. And third, some countries it's increasing at astronomical rates. So this makes you wonder, did the whole world just decide 20 years ago to decide not to exercise or eat? Like every individual in the world decide that? Or is there actually some sort of global framework that we've created that makes it easier for people to make those choices that may not be healthier choices? I think I sort of loaded the way I presented that question to give you an answer. But I think it's really important. And it's a construct that we use when we talk about uh, these issues with patients as well. And that's not to decrease. Um, the empowerment of the individual to change their life. But it's also important for us to recognize you can't change things in your life that aren't changeable, per se. And so our responsibility from a public health perspective is to look around and say, how have we created an, an environment to make it, to enable those patients to make the changes that we're asking them, and to enable us non-patients uh, to make the healthy choices in our community every day, even if not guided by a physician's advice. Again, you can only make choices based upon what's available to you. So you may have many different choices in front of you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a healthy choice or an easy healthy choice in front of you. And I want to remind us also about our history, because we seem to treat noncommunicable diseases as radically different from other public health threats that we've had. But let's think about the approaches that we've used in the 19th century in terms of public health interventions. Have those actually relied upon individual action to make the great achievements that we've seen? So do we tell people, or did we tell people, that responsible people boil their water? Do we tell them to know their butcher to avoid diseases? Did we tell them to just get outside and get fresh air, to avoid crowds, to keep a tidy house, to take care of your refuse? It's simply not the case. We actually changed the environment in which all of us operate to make sure that there was clean water running straight out of the tap. You didn't have to wait for the water to be boiled. That there were um, 
restrictions and regulations around the way in which our foods are prepared, that there is access to fresh air and ventilation, that we have places where we don't necessarily have to remain in crowds. Housing has changed. Um, and the way in which we, um, we pick up rubbish on the roadside is quite different. So all of these things are things that we have done to create an environment that enables people to live healthy and to avoid infectious diseases. And one may argue that's exactly what we need to do with non-communicable diseases. I also want to make this transition because we talk a lot about this in public health, but one of the things that we're not very good at, particularly in the United States, given the way in which our healthcare environment has evolved, is we talk about the clinical environment as totally separate from the public health environment. And so as we think about these interventions that we do in the community, I think we also need to think about the role and responsibility and opportunity in the clinical environment to contribute to public health advances. And so as we talk about enabling patients to make the best choices, I think we also need to talk about enabling providers to make the best choices. So are we really enabled to make the best choices and provide the best care for our patients? And are they easy choices also? Because we as providers are in the same situations as patients are. If the choice is not an easy choice, we may not make it for our patient. So when we, we think about treating garden variety hypertension, for example, this is not complicated. This is not rock, rocket science as, as much as I'd like to think that it's very important that we know how to treat hypertension very well. It's actually not that complicated to do it. And yet, it is complicated to do it, right? It doesn't require that much of an intellectual decision making, but we have many intellectual decision making uh, opportunities to make along the way. And that can make it complicated and difficult, and that can ultimately make the best choice a difficult choice to make. So we have to prescribe a specific medication out of all of a whole plethora of opportunities, monitor labs, blood pressure, titrate the medication, provide the patient to access to self-management tools, support them in their adherence, follow up for scheduling, titrate their medications again, follow up, monitor, educate. We have to keep doing all of these things again and again and again for each patient. And to the extent that we have to consciously think about every single one of those decisions and create a new environment for the patient to do it, are we actually making it easy for us to achieve in the clinical environment what we're trying to tell patients to do in their community environment? So this is the way we typically think about Im um, improving health. We can use a high-risk approach where we sort of lob off the top group. This is what we do as providers. We look at people with blood pressure above 140 over 90, treat them, execute that. That's one way to treat patients and to advance population health. And it's an important segment of the population because they're a very high-risk population. So the interventions can have great impact. Then there's what we learned from, um, in particular, Jeffrey Rose, a British epidemiologist, who made the argument very clearly and saliently that if you reduce risk by just a little bit across a very large population, you may have an even greater impact than if you increase risk a whole lot across a very small high-risk population. That's not to say it's one or the other, but it is a complementary approach to it. So that when we think about the two of these approaches together, ultimately, this is really where population health is. And this is where we are all really players, also not only in the domestic, but in the global community. OK, so let's think about the different paradigms and the way we can have greatest impact versus lowest impact, and the way in where we should think about investing very limited resources. This is a diagram um, that, uh, developed by Dr. Uh, Dr. Thomas Frieden. Um, uh, in 2010, it was published, and we've been sort of bantering it around for a long time. And I put it in, in presentations and have interesting discussions afterwards. There's a lot of um, discussion debate about. But I think what it really does do is think, help us sort of organize in our minds, and perhaps it's not as clean as this, but organize in our minds how we make investments and how those investments have impact. So the argument here is that if we counsel and educate people, for example, one by one, it's a very small impact because it requires a great amount of resources and we can only reach a small number of people. If, however, we really focus on the socioeconomic factors or some of these at the bottom end where we change the context for the way in which people live, we can reach a very large group of people, perhaps with less resources. Now, I will tell you that I'm very troubled by this. I'm troubled by it because we talk about this, and I think this is correct, that where some of the greatest changes can occur is through uh, changing and moderating socioeconomic factors. But the truth is, when we work in public health, we hang out in this change in the context area. We don't really move down into that other area. I think it's because our sphere of influence as public health practitioners is that we don't necessarily make decisions about the economy. But as we mo move into non-communicable diseases and think about them, because it is about lifestyle, because it is about the framework in which we all live, these economic factors are uh, even more important. So we have to figure out a way to actually engage in the agents and actors that influence the socioeconomic factors. So in summary, there are ways in which we can make a big difference. There are ways we can make a difference one by one. We can do it populations that are large, but all together, collectively, 
we have to think about each of the elements and think about where our investments are and make the best decisions for the communities. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about hypertension and raised blood pressure now just to give specific examples and faces to the broader discussion that we just went through. Um, hypertension is the leading cause of uh, non-communicable disease and death, as I showed you earlier. The prevalence is about one-third of adults worldwide have hypertension, similar to the estimates in the United States. That's about a billion people in the world that have um, hypertension. The cost of non-optimal blood pressure control is $372 billion in 2001 estimated to be, which is about 10% of overall health um, expenditures globally. Domestically, it is about 10% also. In some countries in, um, in Asia, Eastern Europe, it's, it's much higher than that. Latin America, it's a little bit lower than that, but it is globally around 10%. And if blood pressure levels remain unchanged, the healthcare costs over the next 10 years are estimated to be a trillion globally. So this is not uh, a, a, a small problem. It's a problem that's very expensive, and it's a problem that if we're able to address, we can have great impact. This, um, this reflects the distribution of blood pressure in the United States. And um, I use it because I think it's important to illustrate this sort of divide of where the clinical environment can reach and where it can't reach. So the green and the yellow are those people who have hypertension. Those are the ones that if they came into your office, you would react and respond. The rest of them, those with normal and with prehypertension, maybe the ones with prehypertension, you would have time to talk with them about it. It depends on what their other diseases are that you're treating that day. You may just avoid it because it looks pretty good. But otherwise, the rest of that population, the vast majority of Americans, certainly those with prehypertension and a percentage of those with normal blood pressure, are at higher risk but will have no intervention at all. And this is where the population interventions that we were talking about can actually reach. And that's why they're important to consider in the portfolio of responses that we have to disease. Now, this is an interesting study done by Bibbins Domingo, published in the New England Journal, where she looks at the impact of a variety of different interventions. I put this here to illustrate and compare the impact of treating those with hypertension. And these are all patients with hypertension, treating them according to the All Hat um, protocol um, in the United States. And the second is looking at the impact of salt reduction uh, on the population in the United States. Um, this is not to pit one against the other, but just sort of to illustrate that they actually, the two of them together, both, uh, will have a remarkable impact, first of all. And second of all, they have a very similar impact. And so, um, the, the, the two sorts of approaches that we have, again, here, in terms of numbers, are, uh, are similar and complementary in, uh, with respect to hypertension. So let's talk a little bit about salt, sodium, and diet. And this is what I call the dietary disconnect. Because since the 1980s, the US dietary guidelines have been produced, and we've been talking to people about how to eat well and what they should eat. And we all know this, and we think it's important for people to be educated. Um, but this is the daily recommendation from the American Heart Association on, based upon their revisions from 2006 and what the U.S. mean intake is. And you'll see that there's a disconnect, clearly. What we're telling people to do and what they're doing is quite different. So when it comes to sodium, uh, the recommended intake is 2,300 milligrams unless uh, you are greater than 51 African American, have hypertension, diabetes, or chronic kidney disease, which happens to be most adults. Then your intake should be around 1,500 milligrams. And yet the mean intake is over 3,000 milligrams of sodium per day. And you'll see similarly, um, we're uh, variably successful in the other recommendations. So what can we do about this dietary disconnect? So this is from all the years that I spent at the health department, sort of thinking about the sphere of influence and how complicated health is and making good decisions. This is what I came up with. <laughs> this is the control that we have. <laughs> And, um, and I think it really boils it down to like, you know, what's around is what you eat. I think that's what it comes down to, right? You can make some decisions, but what's around is what you eat. And when it comes to sodium, it's even more important because most of the salt that we eat every day comes from processed and restaurant foods. It's already in the food at the time that we buy it. It's not what we're adding at the table. It's not what we're adding when we're cooking. It's already there. So again, that's that individual in that food environment. 77% of the salt that we get every day is already in the food. And then when we start to look at the other areas that we can influence when we're cooking, it's a very small amount, about 11% that's added in the home or during cooking. This is the case in high-income countries. In low- and middle-income countries, it varies. Uh, the contribution of uh, salt during cooking is much higher, certainly. But there are some very clear, specific condiments that are processed that play a big role in contr contributing to sodium intake. Um, uh, this is fish sauce in a supermarket in Thailand. Uh, 
Um, it got cut off, but it literally covered the entire aisle. And then it went back around the other side of the aisle. <laughs> so I imagine that people have their favorite that they go for. Um, one thing to be aware of also is that while we have been, um, it's a luxury, and I, I can't even imagine a time where we couldn't turn over a package and see the, the nutrients on the back if we wanted to know that is not necessarily a luxury that most people have in the world. That labeling is not mandatory in most countries, and, and it's done even when it's done in a voluntary fashion. It's not necessarily regulated. So while you see all of these products here, and so that, while many of them may have labels on them, they may be variably enforced in terms of um, whether or not they're truly representing the package. Um, and I'm not speaking specifically to Thailand and on there with respect to enforcement, but, but labeling is not mandatory there. And it's not mandatory in many places. So these products, while they're processed, that doesn't necessarily mean that even if you purchase them and you try to make different decisions that you have that choice because the information may not even be there. So what can we do about it? So these, this is the spectrum of opportunities for sodium reduction. And I've sort of organized it in terms of those that A, have come up and have been discussed, and B, starting at the top, the ones that reach the broader population versus those that rely more upon individual action. So the, one of the, uh, the areas that's been discussed and it actually has an evidence base for it is uh, targeting um, industry reformulation and working on reformulating the products that are out there. And the UK has really taken the lead on this, um, introducing their uh, salt reduction uh, initiative I, it's probably about 13 or 14 years ago now and continuing on where they've actually worked with industry to set targets for sodium reduction and then follow that over time and have actually documented reductions in sodium intake in the uh, population. Again, this is because they're targeting the greatest source or contributor of salt in the diet, similar to the United States that's been processed in restaurant foods. So that is a, a very reasonable approach to think about if you're working in a higher income country where uh, reliance upon processed foods is much greater. Other different variations of that is, are setting policies for uh, the nutrition and food when it's purchased, focusing on feeding programs that are reaching vulnerable populations and putting requirements on the amount of sodium that's in those foods, um, focusing on labeling, which certainly has an impact where people can make decisions about products, not only on packaged foods, but increasingly discussions around um, restaurant foods. And you'll see mandatory labeling um, actually appearing in, 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 in a number of environments shortly in restaurant foods. Um, different ways in which one can think about marketing lower sodium products. Pricing I haven't seen as much work on, um, but it's certainly come up in terms of discussion. Media and awareness campaigns have been shown to be effective, although informing individuals really doesn't make much of a difference if they don't have the tools to take action. So it needs to be complemented with something people can do. Changing ingredients for home cooked uh, prepared foods is another option. And then changing habits of cooking for home prepared foods and, and how people salt at the table. So I want to talk a little bit about this targeting industrial reformulation, because it's a relatively simple approach, and it's an approach that um, has, is really picking up speed globally in a lot of middle-income countries as well as um, higher-income countries. As I mentioned, the UK did it. I will, when I was in New York City, this is an approach we use for the National Salt Reduction Initiative, where we partnered with other state and city governments across the United States. Canada has implemented and is working forward on a, uh, one of these initiatives. And more recently, Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia, all in the Americas, have introduced uh, target-driven reductions in sodium, um, working with industry. Australia, China has in their Shandong province an approach to this as well. So it's something people are really thinking about. The idea is quite simple. Um, you create a database. You need to create a database that has all of the brand products and their nutrition information in it. And from this huge database, you break all of the products into categories. So for example, bread is the largest contributor to sodium in the US diet, so you create a bread category. Then you have to break the bread category into a whole bunch of subcategories because breads are produced differently and the uh, opportunity to reduce sodium in the production of products depends on the way the product's produced. So you may end up with rolls and other products, so then you have subcategories. You look at the mean sodium in that category. So for example, here's an example of uh, sodium in a category. It could be any. We could just pretend that it's a roll, for example. And the mean uh, it's probably not a roll because this sodium is quite high in this product. But um, let's, for the assumption, make it's, it's probably more like a sausage or something. Um, so you have this distribution, and you sit down with industry, and you say, this is what I know. You're producing these products. This is what I know about this category. Um, whoops. And, and you, you negotiate and discuss how you might shift the bell curve. So again, this is a little bit about similar to what Rose was doing, right? But we're doing it in the food environment. We want to shift exposure to a risk. So if we actually shift the way the risk is in and of itself, 
we shift it against the population. So then one would argue you'd like it for it in 2014 to get down to about 400 milligrams. You set the target, and eventually the sodium in those products goes down. You're not trying to reduce just an individual product. You're trying to shift the sodium in the whole category itself so that the choice for individuals is not about a higher or lower sodium product. The choice is about picking from a selection of products that all have lower sodium in them. Ah, there it worked. <laughs> so we've shifted the bell curve, which would ideally be reflected in the population as well. So what have we learned from this approach in changing the environment, in the food environment, focusing on sodium reductions? These are some of the general learnings that I think come from this. First of all, that multi-sectoral partnerships will be key, right? So industry must be at the table for sodium reduction. For example, they produce the products. They need to be partners in this. They are less traditional partners from a public health perspective, but they must be at the table. And you can repeat that every time you think about some other risk factor related to the health environment. We're going to need to pull in multi-sectoral partners. And we're going to have to do it in a way that reflects a potential conflict of interest, again, because there are economies here. We've done this in the medical environment related to the pharmaceutical industry, and we can certainly do it again as we speak about it in public health with respect to other opportunities for change. The other thing is we really need new methods of data collection, monitoring, and surveillance. So I described to you this database that needed to be created. That was a brand new database that didn't exist. The standard reference nutritional database doesn't include this kind of information. We're going to need to do this. We're going to need to be creative in the way that we monitor and, serve, and do surveillance on non-communicable disease. And we're going to need a, a global learning community because, as I talked about, we figured out some options in high-income in, income countries. We still don't know what to do about lowering sodium in foods um, when they're produced in the home or added by the individual. And we need to learn that. We may not have the right environment to learn it here, but it's relevant here. So lessons that we might be learning from other countries that are experimenting in this, for example, in China or in other places, could be quite relevant here. And that's where this exchange becomes so important. OK, quickly I want to talk about tobacco. Um, and Because it's, a, it's quite different from hypertension in the sodium environment, because the actors, the tobacco industry, is very different from those that are in the food environment just by, uh, uh, by the type of product that the tobacco industry produces. So this is smoking prevalence um, by males and females. Again, this is by country you see across males on the right-hand side, females on the left-hand side. And the key things to take home here is that a lot of people smoke in a lot of places. Men smoke more than women, but it's a problem everywhere. And in some places, for males, for example, in Russia, it's 60% and greater. Right. It was not so different here in the United States, not that very long ago. So we just keep that in mind, too. But it, where people are globally is very different. So what can we do about that, and what is the problem? So one-third of all deaths from malignant neoplasms are due to tobacco, one-third of respiratory diseases, and one-third of cardiovascular diseases. So if we can make a change in the people's smoking and tobacco use habits, we can make a huge change in the profile of noncommunicable diseases globally. So uh, the D World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is really, really an interesting model for the way in which one might work to change um, the way in which countries deal with risk factors related to noncommunicable diseases. So the World Health Organization has actually had the, um, the, the, the right to negotiate international treaties ever since it was established. This is the first time it's actually exercised that responsibility and right, and, and it's in response to the uh, globalization of the tobacco epidemic, and, and is justified by reaffirming the right of all people to the highest standards of health. 176 parties, countries, are, uh, have signed on to this. That covers 90% of the world's population and basically includes measures to address or treaties or agreements that these countries have made, agreements to address, issues related to the price of products, to the production of products, to the products themselves, what's the content of, the, um, of nicotine in them, et cetera, how to regulate that, and also the places in which um, tobacco may be used. In order to facilitate this, there's something that's been created that's called the Empower, which is a set of evidence-based measures which are recommended for countries to implement in order for them to meet the responsibilities of the FCTC. And they include monitoring tobacco use and prevention policies, so that's surveillance. Protecting people from tobacco smoke, these are laws to prevent, for example, um, smoking in indoor places. Um, providing assistance to people to offer to quit uh, tobacco use. Warning people about the dangers of tobacco use, um, such as on labels. Enforcing bans on tobacco advertising and raising taxes on tobacco, so affecting the prices. In New York City, this is an example of, the, of what's been done with pricing. So excise taxes are the t prices 
uh, when you increase an excise tax, the individual sees that price in the product when they purchase it. If you increase the sales tax, it's added after you purchase it, as you know. So an excise tax is very effective to influence the way people think about a product before they purchase it, because it's the price that they see on the product. So starting in 2000, the total cost of a pack of cigarettes in New York City was uh, $1.58. Okay, so this is only 13 years ago. So you look at this trend upward, um, increasing federal, New York City, and New York State taxes up to 2010. Now it's $11 a pack. It's one of the highest costs for a pack of cigarettes in the United States. That's a lot. That's a huge change over time, right? And other measures were introduced in New York City as well. And I like this slide because it just really shows us the trend over time and what happens each time New York City introduced one of these new measures that's part of this Empower um, set of measures. So we have about one in five people smoking all the way up until 2002, 2003. Tax gets introduced, plummet. Smoke-free workplaces, plummet. Free nicotine patch distribution, so you call up and you get you know, them sent to your home, continues to go down. We see a little bit of trending in the same, and then they really start hitting again with hard poor media campaigns. This is this complement of media with the ability to act, right? This is where we really use media to enable people to make healthier choices. Increasing taxes again. Federal taxes go up. New York City taxes go up. And you just see this really beautiful trend down. And this is all simply through public policies. This is not about sitting down and talking to your individual patients. Not that that didn't happen, because you're creating sort of a buzz about it. But these are things that city government, combined also with federal and state government, could do and made a huge difference in um, the use of tobacco. So let's move to another country, Uruguay, which had one of the highest rates in the Americas, certainly, in terms of overall um, smoking. 33% um, uh, in 2006 smoked. Um, they came in and they just introduced the entire package, right? And look at this plummet in three years. One in four smokers quit. That's pretty remarkable in a country. These are the kinds of things that can happen when we introduce in a standardized way and use the regulation and enforcement capacity that we have as nations and as a global community to make a difference on the non-communicable disease environment, moderating risky behaviors that were individual choices, but certainly facilitated to be different when you create an environment that allows it to change. So the lessons learned from this approach was innovating approaches to expanding the impact should be innovative, sorry, innovative approaches to expanding the impact should be utilized. And I again mentioned the FCTC as a model. It's not necessarily appropriate for all, but it's really thinking about how do we create evidence-based packages, export them, and help support their implementation. And then this idea of packages themselves um, having just a huge impact. Finally, I want to talk very quickly about the clinical environment and an interesting um, initiative um, that we are starting uh, to, to help support and facilitate. Um, and the idea is to change uh, the control of blood pressure through enabling um, clinical care decisions that are best choices for patients and that help support patients' best choices. So I talked a little bit before about hypertension treatment considerations and how complicated it can be. And some of, some of it varies by the environment that we're working in and the healthcare system that we have. And there are different guidelines that exist in, in not only at the national level, but within healthcare institutions at the United States. There are variations of the JNC-7, and someday there will be a JNC-8. Um, but also other countries have different versions that they use. So people have guidelines, but there are some commonalities of challenges which relate to um, barriers for medication prescription and adherence for patients, which is really what it all comes down to, right? That's what our opportunities are to tell them to change their lifestyle or to give them an effective medication, but that medication will make no difference unless they take it. So the issues related to medication treatment are availability of those medications, the affordability of those medications, and the complexity of the regimens that we're asking patients to follow. And then there are um, also barriers to the effective treatment delivery of those medications. So it's the algorithms that providers are being asked to follow that be can be quite complicated. And another example is just inadequate patient follow-up, as I discussed before. Like, how do you get the person back in? How do you get them to take their medication? How do you get them in the community to continue to follow the recommendations you've made? There's some really interesting opportunities to learn from what's been done with respect to tuberculosis. And that's one of the models that we're really thinking about now, because we, we should be learning from um, successes in infectious disease. These are not totally different environments that we're working in. So with respect to tuberculosis, one of the things that they did was standardized treatment, right? So there's a, no matter where you are in the world, there are a set prescribed set of medications that you should take if you have TB to be treated. And one of the advantages of that is when you have a set uh, uh, sort of core set of medications that are expected to be used, you drive demand and you drive supply. And you have the opportunity to leverage that and make those very broadly available. 
The other thing that they've done in TB was really think about a structured, structured approach aimed at high quality standardized care. Ultimately, that they hold themselves accountable for each patient and for the outcome of that patient. They set targets and indicators, and they do a lot of data collection, evaluating, and reporting. This is a little bit of the way we think about patient registries, panel management in the, in the current clinical environment. And then they use that information around targets and indicators to define and uh, further actions and, and create additional indicators. So this is a framework created for tuberculosis. I will acknowledge that TB is not well controlled everywhere in the world, but this is a, a, an approach of standardizing and simpli simplifying it. And maybe we can use that idea of standardize and simplify globally when we talk about hypertension. So the opportunities in the pharmacologic treatment of hypertension, similar to what we've just talked about with TB, would be identifying a core set of medications. Not necessarily that only those medications would be available, but could we set a core set of medications, one diuretic, not just any diuretic, but one diuretic. Could we identify a single diuretic that's available everywhere so that when the patient runs out, they're not switched to a different one, right? Can we make those medications available everywhere? And then can we find the key elements of care delivery that make us effectively deliver care? And so the Global Standardized Hypertension Treatment is an initiative that we are helping support and that we are just launching uh, now out of the CDC working collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization. And we're also working with state, key stakeholders across the Americas, first to pilot in this region and then to uh, help expand it out globally. The purpose is to support a strategy and framework for standardizing hypertension pharmacological treatment that would have worldwide applicability. We're not touching the, the lifestyle area of it. It's an important critical area, but this specific project is just focused on the medication. And the goal is that it would support existing evidence-based guidelines for diagnosis of treatment of hypertension. We're not trying to harmonize the way people you know, what blood pressure they treat to, how they select people who need to be treated, that's all up to the countries. As long as it's an evidence-based approach and it's standardized, it's fine. What we're trying to do is complement it with making sure that the medications that are being integrated into those guidelines are available, affordable, and that the patients get those medications delivered in a way that helps support them continuing the care. The lessons learned from initiating this is that we can certainly extend support for the best decisions in the clinical environment the same way we think about the best decisions in the community environment for us as consumers and as residents. And so that clinical care really is a population approach, and we should think of it that way. We should, we're increasingly think of it, thinking of it that way with respect to the Affordable Care Act, certainly. Um, we should think about it as we plan forward also in low- and middle-income countries. Also, that effective chronic care management is something that we can aspire to globally, and that it's relevant in low, middle, and income, high-income high countries. Um, a lot of the work that we do in low, middle-income countries is focusing on population effects, but we should not neglect the fact that there needs to be a very strong and robust clinical environment to complement that. And uh, more lessons, I'm sure, to come, because this is, a, this is early in this process. So in summary, to reduce this risky behavior that we started with thinking about individuals making, we really need to make the healthy choice the easy choice, and it's all about making the healthy choice the default. So as we move forward, we need to think about multi-sector engagement in development initiatives. We need to think about a robust learning community, about sharing information, and how critical that is, not only in the United States, but globally. We need to innovate um, with solid evaluation of those models. We need to think about developing models that are scalable. We shouldn't spend our time coming up with interesting models if they're not something that can be ramped up to reach broader uh, populations, and they absolutely should be evidence-based or evidence-informed. We should think about ways to do rapid dissemination when we find solutions. We need to find mechanisms to sustain, and this is where government becomes so key as long-term um, uh, investors in, in the countries in which they're uh, responsible for. And then I think what it all comes down to is data, because while it's about saving lives, we won't know about who we're saving unless we understand who they are. And all of that comes from data systems. So thank you.
right. This is a challenge because I think evaluation is really, it's about, it's about investment to begin with. So any program or initiative, it needs to be anticipated that you want to evaluate it so you build it into the budget. And that becomes a political discussion and a question about value and the way in which we in the government and, and, and you as you write your proposals are able to articulate the importance of evaluation. And I, I think it's absolutely key. And so we need to all reiterate in our work how important not only the project, but the evaluation is. And the key underlying argument is that it's a fiscal responsibility, right? Because if we're spending our money on things that aren't having impact, then we're being fiscally irresponsible. So an evaluation isn't really an option. It should be part and parcel of any project in order to make sure that it's legitimate and should be continued to be um, uh, financed. So that's the argument for it. So the, the challenge is that we do need to find ways to make sure that it's affordable to do. And this is where the innovation comes in. So I, I, or as an example, um, in New York City, um, w when we initiated the Trans Fat Initiative, we wanted to reduce the use of trans fat in restaurants, but we need to know what the level of use was in restaurants. There's no data for that, right? So, and there's no infrastructure for collecting it. But what we did do, and what we do know, is that we have uh, food inspectors that go into restaurants every single day. I mean, that's an entire infrastructure that's already there. So the, and we worked with them, taught them how to assess if there's trans fat in food, and ta taught them how to collect it, and sent them out into the field to collect that data. So I think that's an example of how we need to think about using the infrastructure that already exists so that we find cost-efficient ways to collect data. Because in, if you go into low- and middle-income countries right now, there are a million surveys going on constantly, huge investments in surveys. This organization, this interest has some money, and so they're doing all of these surveys, and, and we do them in the United States too, and I can't help but think we could be much more cost-efficient if we actually sat together and said, let's just do one survey, or let's do two surveys, and we'll put all of this information in there together. So the second point is that it requires <coughs> planning. And the third piece is that, in particular in the clinical environment, there's a lot of data that's there that's just simply not being used. So before we think about collecting new data, the question is, what is the existing data that's there that's already exists that we could use as an evaluation tool? I thought it was very interesting to hear you talk about partnering with organizations and companies who might otherwise, I would think, be your opponents. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you start to talk about the use of sodium in processed food, my understanding is that because food manufacturers use such low quality ingredients that they have to use sodium to make it palatable. So, I'm, I'm curious about these conversations that you have with them because they have an actual conflict of interest to actually undermine your work. So, so what yeah. do these conversations actually go? Well, I, so I think, um, I, I think the, the reality is it's, it's never as simple as, as it may seem. So it's true that cost, that sodium is a low cost flavor enhancer, but it is not the only flavor enhancer and it's not the only way, it's not the only reason that sodium is used. So for example, in bread, sodium actually uh, titrates the rate at which, which the yeast acts. And so it really serves more in the manufacturing process to figure out how quickly you can make your bread, which doesn't necessarily have to do with the cost of sodium in the bread or the taste of the sodium in the bread. So there's different reasons that sodium is used. So I think, first of all, from um, at we as healthcare, it, those of us working in the public health environment, we need to understand the motivations and the reasons in which different actors are making specific decisions. Because I think your, your comment is, is true in some conditions, but not necessarily true in others. So until we actually figure all of that out, we can't come up uh, with solutions to work with them on it. And the, the other piece is that when it comes to economics, the base price or the immediate profit isn't only the only motivator of many companies and corporations because they too operate in our community and they too have long-term interests in being um, uh, viable. And so there are definitely different reasons for doing many different things. So I think ultimately the goal is to find out where that common area of interest is and to work around the commonalities, but to be very transparent about where the potential conflicts are so that there is no either perceived or real conflict of interest when the final decisions are being made. If everybody knows why they're at the table, then, then people can look with transparency at the reason that decisions are being made. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm interested in the fact that a lot of these interventions are directed towards adults, mm -hmm. and the future actually is on healthy children. Yeah. For a lot of us, it might be, I wouldn't say too late, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but our brains are less malleable, and the effect of food on food and other things are uh, less dramatic, and it might be the next generation which has opportunities before that time to 
to grow as a healthier generation. So what kinds of interventions can be specifically tailored towards children, particularly in the era of um, social media and uh, different ways of communication that we're actually, as adults, very familiar with that might actually influence what's coming in sort of future public health approaches given the younger generation? Yeah, so I think this question of how we tailor population approaches to different subpopulations of interest is a really complicated one, but also a really important one to have because there are cost efficiencies when we do one intervention for everyone, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it reaches everyone, and in fact, we may aggravate existing health disparities if we're introducing interventions assuming that they'll have the same impact on all populations and they don't. So when we talk about children, I mean, and, and I definitely uh, the, the bias and the data that I was presenting is in adults. A lot of the, uh, again, a lot of the data that we have in, is in adults because you can collect data in adults. And in children, it becomes more complicated because you have to get special permission and the data sources are a little different. So that may have a little bit to do with the way we present and think about these things. But for tobacco, for example, um, and a lot of these salt reduction, you know, you can talk about food, you can talk about adult decision making. Um, a lot of what kids eat at home is what the parents are cooking for them. And so even baby food, you might recall where, you know, moms would taste, dads would taste the baby food before they gave it to the baby. If it tasted good to them, then they thought it tasted good to the baby. But if your palate is already expecting, you know, tons of salt, you're, you're just going to be passing along that habit, that expectation to your child. So it's something we do really need to think about and sort of break up as we move <coughs> forward. Um, in terms of interventions, a lot of the work around the younger generation has been focused on school environments because those are captive audiences and that's a place where children are for eight or more hours. And so um, when, when we talk about physical activity initiatives, food initiatives, um, education, and also using children to disseminate messages to parents about hypertension control, that's a really, really interesting environment. I think that that's where a lot of the innovations have occurred, also because it's efficient to reach children in that environment. Uh, New York City has led, I think, several centers in the country in trying to create a healthy environment. I have not been the last one of us, as you all know. My question has always been a little choice versus public good. Mm -hmm. I wonder where you fall within that domain, especially with the public and the army, sugary drinks, and all of that. How do you defend it? How do you deal with that? If you talk about taking away individual people to choose what you want to do? Yeah. Um, so it's a really very important question. I think that what it comes right down to is that we, you know, we, we are a democracy, and the government, city, state, and, and federal government exists because it has the endorsement of the people. And the rights that we have and the authorities that we have as government have been given to us historically with the establishing of the nation and over time. So in New York City, the Board of Health has the right to regulate on all things related to health. Now, that's huge, right? So the board, what, what, how do we define you know, where health ends? I mean, one could argue that that could expand into many different areas of the economy, even because you can make a health argument there. The question is how that's interpreted over time. Um, and so every time a new initiative is introduced, there is the potential that one might think, because it's a population approach, that it may limit individual choices. I think it's up to those people in government to explain to citizens how it may or may not be the case, and then ultimately it is up to the population to make the decision. So you see these things working their way through court systems appropriately and legitimately, and ultimately the decision is made by the, by the court, or it may be made by the Board of Health, or it may be made informally or formally in other appropriate policy settings. So it's different for everyone, and I think ultimately it's uh, up to those that are introducing and proposing the initiatives to think very carefully about how they affect individuals as well as the populations at large so that they can be prepared to respond to those questions. I know there are a million other questions. Why don't we stop here and grab our speaker. After